Hi, everybody. Today I'm with Angelica Berry, uh, Russ Berry's widow, a lifelong businesswoman and philanthropist. Angelique Berry has transformed the world with leadership and finding causes, funding causes from diabetes care to religious intolerances and nanotechnology. She began by selling paper mache angels. She currently serves on the Russ Berry Foundation as well as many other boards, including her own Angelique Berry Foundation. Uh, she co-wrote a book, Passion for Giving, to educate and inspire other philanthropists. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about the role of the troll dolls and philanthropy. So good morning and thank you so much for joining us here. So let's start out with what uh, influenced you to go into business because you're a businesswoman. Well, I love paper. I always loved paper. And in the Philippines, we were in the beginnings of an export um, industry. And women were at the forefront of that industry and it allowed me to employ hundreds of women to work from home, creating paper jewelry, which actually led to my getting to meet Russ. Ah. So it was interesting that you started with Paper Angels and then your name is, uh, it was like a momento that you were going to be working with angels and serving an angelic purpose in the world as well by being a philanthropist and helping. It's um, it's a coincidence, but Russ used to tell me, I don't know about your name because you're no angel. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a bit of a fiery spirit there. Well, he thought he was marrying a subservient Asian woman uh. <laughs> <laughs> who walked two steps behind him. I think he was in for a big surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely sounds like you've... Um, uh, did a lot of leadership and took on a lot of causes. And I read in your book about um, your champion for women and women's rights and women in business. Some very eye-opening statistics you had in there. Well, you know, there is a great wealth transfer that's coming in the next decade. And that is a lot of women inheriting or, yes, inheriting in a way um, the trillions of dollars from husbands who they were are likely to survive because their longevity is always um, in favor of women. But also you see it now with Lorraine Powell Jobs, who is making a huge difference from the, the fortune that Apple uh, brought to her husband and um, the thoughtful philanthropy that comes with women, the way women think. I think women give in a different way and you see it too with Mackenzie Scott, formerly yes. married to Amazon's Jeff Bezos. And the gifts that she has made are going to shift philanthropy in a very big way. She's made gifts to LGBTQ causes and to American black, black colleges. And I think that that's going to make a huge difference in moving the needle in causes like that. Yes, I've read about that. It was quite significant, and particularly the amounts of money that, that she, um, she was given away to the causes. I think, yeah, LGBTQ has never had gifts of that magnitude before. Um, so, well, my question's here. It said, um, so you started in business young from a very young age and then I started in business as a young age um, organizing things when I was five and six years old and by the time I was 10 years old I had a dog sitting business so some passion within us drives women to create and and have a passion for for getting things done and that's how I got my troll was through the business because my collection of trolls was very passive until it became a business expense and then I had license to get more dolls and to expand on it and uh, follow up with that. So how did the Russ, the dolls impact Russ's uh, very successful greeting card business? Well, you know, when you have a, 
a source of revenue that generates in at its peak $250 million in sales, it certainly, you can certainly say that it fueled our philanthropy, that it enabled Russ to be generous in a, in a scale that he would never have imagined. And it was not only trolls, it was the entire gift and toy business that we were in. He called it impulse gifts as opposed to toy industry or, or gifts alone because they were gifts that were initiated by the impulse to buy. That they were kind of irresistible little things that you couldn't say no to yourself when you wanted to, to acquire it. So I think that that was definitely a, a big source of his success, but not the only one. You know, his, his success with 10 years also fueled our philanthropy and a lot of other gift gift items. We were, at that time, we were number one in ceramic mugs. Mm. And having a sales force of 500 all over the world certainly fueled the ability to sell almost anything and get it into distribution channels that were our specialty, the mom and pop stores. As well as your specialty was that your your the message that went with the dolls and and all the paraphernalia you sold was mes messages of hope and peace and love, uh, much like the philanthropy about being kind to one another. And and being I think Russ, Russ was in the business of selling happiness. You know, I don't re I don't know if you recall we had one ad campaign that said make someone happy and he. He labored over the language of that to say he didn't make everyone happy, but he wanted to make someone happy. And uh, the idea of a very me to you kind of business was very much what the greeting card uh, industry is about, because uh, every gift should speak to you. Yes, I think that was a major success. So at the Troll Museum, we often say, are trolls real? And I like to say, yes, trolls are. They're an earth element and they embody the universal message that if you're good to other people, good things happen to you. Um, kind of a golden rule. So that's, that's a good message. And uh, considering how they started as um, earth spirits in Norway and uh, very ugly ones that, uh, you know, I think Russ's success was he made them lovable and, uh, and totally charming. Yes, yes. And three generations now have uh, have done it. Plus his other great, well, he's got two other great strategies that I recognize is one that the um, he had multiple designs for his dolls so that they could. And we generated from different um, suggestions from people children made a lot of suggestions they would ask for soccer trolls i mean his salespeople were constantly generating ideas from the customers who would store owners would say you know what i sell to a lot of hairdressers maybe you should have a hairdresser troll you know so college teams who wanted their own kind of cheerleader or a soccer player so i think that a lot of it wasn't just generated by Russ's idea, but also from the customers themselves. So it was very responsive to, because I see a lot of businesses also, from Minute Maid to State Farm to Bob Evans restaurants had the Russ shirts customized to represent their businesses as well. And remember, we used to have football teams and baseball teams and um, licenses Yes. to be able to put those on our trolls. Yes, for the baseball and the football. So here at the Troll Museum, we have the Troll Hall of Fame with the Troll Bowl Stadium so that all the trolls and customized troll dolls to represent the mascots as well as those original franchise t-shirts um, from, the, from the vintage trolls. So yeah. that was a lot of fun. Was there ever any designs that uh, never made it past the drawing board that that uh, you can recall? There was one that was bigger than than this one. Ah. Um, a huge one. I remember we used it for a television commercial. And 
it was so huge that it it could be the size was like the max but beyond it Russ made the determination that it was too big it was too bulky even as a collector item it was not it didn't have the lovability you know it looked a little more grotesque uh. so i think this didn't work in terms of the charm that we were always looking for right because didn't want to scare because that was a big thing about yes, the trolls that's being important. scary it, it looked scary ah very interesting so did you have a favorite themed one um I think I sent you a picture. I, I have a mermaid one that I, I really love. And I found it on eBay. I oh. don't recall we're seeing it in the product line, but I found it on eBay and it's a Ross mermaid troll. And I bought it just recently to give to my grandniece. Ah. So is there now was... that are a big fad, you know, I yes. I wish I had them yes, sooner. Yes, yes the mermaids. So they had two mermaids. One was a, like the three inch ones and it was just a piece of fabric tail. And then the other one was at one of the Travis and Tracy, the fashion Barbie trolls. And she has an actual uh, stuffed tail that comes out. Was that the one? Um, this one had like an iridescent pinkish kind of tail. That was, that was a cloth one, but it was, it was about this ah, so the Travis and Tracy ones. Yes, that was yeah. their uh, attempt to to rival Barbie, the fashion troll dolls. Yeah, to do a doll version of the troll. Yeah, longer, skinnier legs. So, yeah. Um, so, did Russ have any particular ones that he liked? What was the story behind his custom troll doll with the sweater and his signature on the back of the neck? I think it was um, an attempt to have uh, a collectible troll because everything was collectible. And I don't know that it was, uh, it distinguished itself as unique except for the clothing that was really more different, uh, required more labor, nicer materials. But I think every troll was collectible and I think that's what made it so successful. In places like the Philippines, we heard that there were kids renting out their trolls for five pesos a oh night. <laughs> so that's how collectible they were. And in Spain too, I recall that my cousins tell, telling me that um, people, the kids were trading their trolls, but not trading them permanently. I mean, like sharing. Ah. So they Give the economy. They were sharing it, like loaning them out to each other. That's that's cool. Yeah. Yes, the trolls certainly caught on worldwide. Um, we see evidence of troll collectors from all over the world showing up on Facebook, and then people coming to the museum here are from all over the world, um, booking well in advance. Of course, the COVID things kind of slowed us down, but you can see a troll's got his mask on there, so we're promoting um, health, healthy practices for everyone. So the other big component of the Russ was his, his uh, sales team and his unique approach to that. Tell us a little bit about how his sales teams work differently than other corporations. I think the best thing about the Russ sales force was that they were and Embedded in them was the the trade were the traits that made Russ successful. He was able to train every every manager in his style. He would personally manage them at that time by email, um, looking at their booking numbers and being able to send them an email saying, "Your salesperson was off for so many weeks on pregnancy," and she was able to sell this much and your other salesperson who is not pregnant, their productivity is the same. So he had that level of um, in-depth information from his booking mm. reports. I think made them fine tune every single salesperson's performance. He set very high standards and he managed details himself. Um. I still have his salespeople sent me memos from him 
with the level of detail that you wouldn't believe the chairman of at that time we were almost in the 500 million dollar range a chairman of a public company would pay attention to i think also the fact that our salespeople were direct salespeople they were only selling runs they did not sell other people's lines and that um, that did not dilute their focus attention and um, level of expectation so I think that was our success. Plus, we had salespeople everywhere. We had salespeople in the UK, a sales force and distribution centers in the UK, in Europe, in um, in Asia, and um, in Canada. And so I think that level of global outreach was unique for a company in that time. Oh, I definitely agree there. Uh, trying to motivate motivate your employees to sell as as uh, if it was worth your business as their business. So um, he started. And you own the channel with your own salespeople who are accountable only for selling your own product. It's uh, it's incomparable what you can put into that channel of distribution. I know he was. I've met um, Russ Hines. Remember Russ Hines, VP of Sales. I'd met him. He was quite broken-hearted when the company closed. We all were, and um, you know, it took Russ 40 years to build this company to what it was, and um, to to sell it after his death, and um, then to see it go bankrupt was um, very surreal. You know, many of our salespeople. Their kids only knew their parents' lives through the eyes of being a Russ uh, employee. And so it was very traumatic. I think a lot of us needed psychological help after the uh, Yeah, so do you think that was his, because he, from what you're saying, because of his, his uh, personal touch to the company, that without it, uh, the magic was gone? I think that um, understanding the distribution channel of mom and pop, at the same time having big um, accounts like the Targets and the Toys R Us, was something unique in the industry that you, it's not easy to navigate. And he personally did that. So yes, that's the, that's one factor. The ability to generate product, his instincts were. I think so finely tuned to what the market wanted. He introduced, he would introduce trolls every five years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, sooner or later, this is going to come back. And um, he was usually right. And I think that that kind of instinct, you cannot duplicate. But um, separately from that, you know, to have um, an investment company uh, buy, buy the company and run it like a toy company, was um, was going down the wrong alley and um, not being able to manage both channels of mom and pop and the mass market, which they instinctively went to what they thought would be generating huge dollars. And Russ used to say that he never wanted to be in a position where if Target sneezed, his whole business would um, shake. So he said that what he wanted was uh, a good balance. He always maintained the strength of his mom and pop business. He said that's what made our company and the small retailers of America, you know, middle America's retailers were the lifeblood of our industry. And um, in this pandemic, we see so many of them. And every year the attrition was terrible. But he really believed in the small retailer, the specialty stores and the mom and pops, the card stores. You see them going by the wayside even oh, before most, he, yeah. Most definitely the trend, the big Walmarts and even the Targets and of course the Amazon online is, is really, really hurt the small stores because that's what I've done here in Alliance is created a tourist destination and historic downtown and bringing in businesses, but I've been doing more for entertainment as opposed to merchandise because so many of the younger generation are getting away to be minimalist and not have 
the sentimental toys and impulse items that they used to have, like the mugs. Um, and really, the, the World Wide Web has allowed anyone who wants to collect or find a particular trove to find it without going to a store. So your idea of having an experience, I think, is probably the best way to do it. Yes. So we've gotten uh, Troll Museum seven years. It's been our anniversary seven years now. And then we opened Wisecrack's Comedy Escape Room and now Mad Dog's Crazy Cat Cafe where we host cat adoptions by our local animal sanctuary and provide education about different cat breeds so that people can come learn about the cats as well as interact with the cats. And so it's making a day journey to come and do all three events at our, at our place here. So I'm hoping someday well, you'll be able to, to come. And well, I'll try. I'll yeah. try. Yes. Well, as the world starts moving, we're getting more local traffic for sure as people start uh, getting out and moving about more. All right. Uh, the power of women. That was... Um, That was quite exceptional. So in your book, how did you find uh, sales of it? Well, we don't really, I didn't track any of the sales and because it is a, a book about philanthropy it has a limited audience. I found that I was more successful giving it away mm -hmm. to all my, all, anyone who would ask me because usually that's what people want to know. How do you start? How do you know how to focus your giving. How do you know how to begin in the first place? And so that was the point of view I took when I wrote the book. It's advice about questions people would normally ask me. And um, what I did was I posed a lot of the questions that I felt people who were beginning their journey in philanthropy, already practicing philanthropists or even experienced philanthropists sources of inspiration to because philanthropy is a learning journey and we are constantly learning from our mistakes from the way we give from the things that inspire us and so i interviewed a lot of very successful and uh, inspiring people uh, people who were experts in in wealth management and uh, giving advice to very experienced philanthropists and um, experienced philanthropists themselves to say, what's the one lesson you'd want a new or um, a new or aspiring philanthropist to remember, not just to learn, but to to remind them of why we're all giving, right. what's important about giving, what's fulfilling about giving, and the stories that I think I was able to gather. I, up to now, I think, inspire me. Well, most definitely, I found a lot of things inspiring, especially about the women, because at whatever level of income you have, um, people all are have the feeling that they want to give to each other. And who do they give for and what causes do they give and how do they figure out which is the best way to go about it? Because now we have so many choices on um, Facebook. They have the GoFundMes and, and this organization and that organization and yes over the years there's a lot of questions about who's legit who's not legit and how much and I see a lot sherry of um, giving circles all almost all of them are for women and these giving circles are because women like to give together they like to learn from each other they like the social contact and the um, ability to process what they're learning together as you say you know to know what's legit what's not what's a good way to give what's a better way to give and i think that's just the style of how women give as opposed to men who give in a very different way that was a uh, very enlightening plus the distribution of of the wealth um the interesting how you said that 70 percent of the um of the wealth in the U.S., the women stand to inherit. So, and even now, a very huge percentage of the buying power rests in the hands of women, 
you know, who makes the decision for what groceries to buy, what insurance to 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 get for the family, and and a lot of that has been in in the hands of women, education of the kids, and so when you think about it, we have collective um, a collective force, and we should use our collective voice to be able to influence healthcare, to be able to influence decisions like what the Biden administration now is trying to do that affect families and um, and children especially. Yes, that definitely have felt like the um, a lot of the governments have been controlled by by men in positions and it's all been about um, financial good for them and not necessarily the good of all the people. Definitely. And, and political and it's all about politics as opposed to saying what do people who are below the poverty line really need and how can we get it to them faster. Right. Yes, it definitely feels it. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more women in positions of power and making those kind of decisions and using the criteria like you've pointed out, that they make decisions in a different way than men do to think about the world in general. So. Amen. Yes, being that we're, I'm a woman-owned business and ran business here and we, my day job, my tourism business hasn't became financially successful, uh, pays for the employees, and we've been gaining every year, but I still provide housing for the mentally ill. And that's a whole nother system that's terribly underfunded in the last 30 years since I've been working in it. It's, it's just gone way um, underfunding to underfunded to underfunded and under they can't hide, find quality people to work there because they don't have the money to pay them. They don't have the money to keep people in the hospital and the monies all go to the drug companies. And it's not um, not a good system but at all. I think it's there now that wasn't uh, as, as uh, deep as it used to be with people like Prince Harry um, Speaking advocating up. for mental health and um, the royal family in the UK speaking openly about their own struggles with it. I think that um, people are more aware of it. Sports, sports people are talking about their own struggles. We are in a different age in awareness as to programs that actually are funded. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. But yes, awareness is coming, just like all the mass shootings and things. That's all related back to the failure of the mental health system to screen and support and help people and being at the front lines and providing the housing i really feel uh, the crunch of it and advocate on behalf of of them all yeah so what's your latest project well we have we just celebrated 25 years of make the raspberry making a difference awards ah. and uh, 25 years of identifying and acknowledging and rewarding everyday heroes. I say that we have, um, Russ wanted unsung heroes to be recognized. He said that news would always be about bad things happening. Nobody ever says, oh, you know, this kid was rescued by uh, somebody or, uh, or this person did a really good deed. Nobody pays attention to good news. This is what his theory was when he created this award. And in 25 years, we've had like 380 people um, rewarded as winners, but also we created a field of thousands more who are um, a network in New Jersey. It's focused in New Jersey and the people who've been nominated are all part of uh, what I call a collective force for good. And um, together and separately, they're generating a lot of positive energy to help in every different area. We have young people in particular doing unusual things like gathering toothbrushes for, mm -hmm. for different places where people don't have access to a toothbrush, the homeless, you know, uh, people in shelters, uh, people with mental health issues. And who would think that a simple act like that could make such a 
such a difference. This young woman who started it was probably, I think, in high school. And the fact that she's now given out millions of toothbrushes. People donate from uh, companies and um, people help her gather new uh, dental kits. It makes a difference. Yes, yes, I totally agree with the, the news focuses on all the negative, but that the world is full of people that are pulling together and helping each other and good things are happening much more abundantly than the negative. And so that and, is- a, and, and I think the award was really meant to highlight the value that no one is too small to make a difference, that every act matters, every, every act that does not require money. I mean, many of the, the criteria is that many of these winners um, are not people of wealth. And so what they do is really material. It makes a huge difference in one person's life. And um, that was what Russ was striving for, that culture of giving regardless of your means. And so we who are philanthropists and uh, have the ability to give big checks also have to model a behavior that encourages others who can't write big checks to participate in, in giving and to know that what they give is equally valuable. Yes, that's, that's such a, uh, such a well felt message here. Um, it's going to help, help everybody. If everybody, just like I said, if everybody was just kind, did always do the kindest thing. That's what I tell my mentally ill people. I said, we're just going to do the kindest thing to, to resolve any situation. And when everybody's being kind, all the problems are solved and everybody's needs will get met. So, all right. Um, uh, I saw they gave a big chunk of money to the COVID uh, relief funds. And also um, what's going on in Israel? You're still with the nanotech helping yes. education? COVID, COVID is going to, the long tail of COVID is going to be with us for many years, even after we vanquish this virus with vaccines. I think that um, people who have lost jobs and may not be able to go back into the workforce, people who have lost their homes because they lost their jobs, people whose health care will be there forever because of the long effects of uh, the long haul effects of COVID. And so we are not yet seeing, I think, the full extent of, we see it in the food lines. I mean, I see it here in New Jersey, which is one of the wealthier states. You see people lining up for food in cars. These are not homeless people. In cars for miles at food banks and food pantries. So you can imagine what it's going to be like when um, the PPP money runs out when um, restaurants still can't reopen. I think we have not yet seen the full impact of on the economy of all the effects that COVID has brought to our lives, you know. Oh, yes, I think we're just on the edge of it from the, my mental health and medical background. It's but once again, but we're also seeing, Sherry, how people are responding with um, GoFundMe campaigns, very spontaneous acts of kindness and generosity that I think are unbelievable to see in this time, that people helping each other. I, I, I read uh, a writer describe this as a time when people are not falling apart, they're falling together. And as a yes. community, these are what we need in times like this, that we have to come together instead of uh, falling apart. I, th I think the world's full of a tons of assets and resources and they just need to be well, shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right, any other questions you might have about the Troll Museum or uh, topics we've covered today? I heard you had a donation of thousands of trolls from somewhere that someone had donated like 4,000 trolls to you one in early days, I guess. 
So the single largest donation was over 4,000 trolls. It was a young man not far from here in Pennsylvania. He'd collected them as a project to um, build rapport with a girlfriend, but it fell apart. <laughs> so he, he preferred to collect pezzes. So when his parents were wanting their garage back, it was stacked full of boxes and boxes of trolls. They weren't the most rare or valuable trolls, but any troll that comes to the museum, um, we gratefully accept. And we also like their stories. So when I'm giving tours of the museum, I will tell people about the stories behind the trolls that come to the museum. Now, the furthest oh, that's that- great. Yes, it was a good story. So I tell people, don't, don't do that because it won't work. It won't make your spouse love you if you collect trolls. <laughs> so the, but there's quite a few poignant stories that come two um, grandkids brought their Grammy's collection from Florida. She lived in a trailer in Florida. They brought her troll t-shirt and all these black plastic bags full of trolls, about 1,700 of them. They traveled all the way from Florida to here, dropped it off and drove back. They just broke, brought them up here just to, because grandmother loved the troll dolls and so they wanted to honor her by putting the troll dolls in a place where they would be preserved and shared and cared for. So I cleaned them all up and sorted them out and, and some went to the collection, some go to new homes and some can be customized behind my, here that's the custom wall of fame of customized troll dolls, ones that have been painted and redressed in new costumes and things like that. So um, people bring their beloved troll dolls that they've loved, we've got one here that came in a box. And we, like I said, we talk about their story. So it came in this little fruit box and it had its own little blanket. And then she had handmade wow. clothes. And then laying in the bed is the little troll. So for 60 years, it had been her mother's and she kept it very safe in this little box, sort of like a coffin, but um, and the mother brought it here personally um, when her mother had passed away to share it with the museum and to give it. And then they'll take pictures and share those pictures and check back on their trolls to see how they're doing in the museum. So that was an unexpected uh, phenomena that people started mailing me and sending me their trolls. And small mom and pop shops would say, I have this inventory. And when I sold the troll dolls, I made all this money and I kept one of each kind. And here's my box of the trolls that I personally kept back, the, the shopkeepers kept back. Um, and then they would um, sometimes donate and sometimes they just offer them to me at a price that's affordable. So I don't go out and buy any of those really super expensive ones, but some of the people will spend up to 15, 16, $1,800 or more on a single troll doll. Yeah, I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so an expensive piece of happiness. Yeah, and I, I commend you for thinking of creating a museum for trolls because um, when Russ and I even thought about something like putting them all together in one place, it was too overwhelming a project. Mm -hmm. And in this time of uh, a pandemic, when people are depressed and need a bit of happiness. I think the trolls offer a lot of um, nostalgia and good memories of a time when we were all healthy and happy and whole. Yes. So on our tours, they're guided, educational, interactive, and funny. So we tell silly jokes and um, funny things. And we also offer virtual. We've had a few people take up um, the option for virtual tours of the Troll Museum. And then people really seem to be enjoying the YouTube videos that I did where I just talk about trolls, talk about the latest trolls that are here and, and just show them different aspects of trolls. Because no one, when you put all the troll history and dolls in one space, people can't believe how many different companies and how many different types and how much history there is about a troll. So it's rather, amazing and overwhelming to anybody that comes in. And do you have a YouTube channel for your troll hole? Yes, it's the Troll Hole Museum. And we're trying to get to a thousand subscribers, um, but we're about 300 now. But people will show up and they said, I, I'm from Indiana and I saw you on YouTube. And so 
that's why I plan my visit. So I'm like, okay, it might not be very large numbers, but it's certainly bringing in business. And then one fellow said he um, binge watched. He binge watched all 30 of them before he came. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I don't watch them. It's a tonic, right? It's a tonic for these times. And yes. So I think that mm -hmm. the, if you also publicize the, the channel on our Raspberry Facebook page, I think oh, you get a lot, idea. a lot idea. of our sales people would recommend it to their people they know who probably collect it and love the idea of the tropes. I do get, um, there was a lady from Akron, Ohio, and she said, I used to be a Russ Berry representative, and um, she called and made connection with us. So, yes, you had very, very loyal employees from the Russ Berry company. And they still are a virtual family on Facebook. Okay, I will check that out. So, really appreciate your time today. I don't want to keep you any much longer, and um, I'll send you a link when we get our YouTube together for you to share. And we'll keep trolling on and passing the message of being kind to each other because that I think is a universal belief and that's what the trolls embody and that's what Russ embodied about being kind to each other and all of his products carried that message as well. And the message of happiness that we can give to anyone for free. Yes, yes. So thank you, Sherry. This was wonderful to see your troll, a bit of your trolls from the screen, mm -hmm. and I hope mm -hmm. to see them in person one day. All right. Bye. 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 -bye.